Hi, my name is Masako Mazomuse. Today I'm going to be in conversation with the renowned author Tizi Dangaramba, the famous author of Nevis Conditions, filmmaker, feminist, writer, festival director who works out of Zimbabwe and mentors young women filmmakers. She's one of, uh, I think, one of the most influential feminist uh, public intellectuals. So Titi joins me for a conversation to discuss this book that we published last year, Towards Democratic Developmental States in Southern Africa, which is really one, a reflective book written by scholar practitioners who have been, who are embedded in social justice movements, who have really been concerned about um, you know, the failure of our rapid economic growth in Southern Africa to deliver for the poor and to, you know, the failure of growth to address uh, inequality in, in, in our region. So, um, Titi, um, you were quite actively engaged from the, the time that we, we launched this book and from the time that we started having these conversations. What is it that moved you about um, you know, the whole question of uh, developmental states in Southern Africa? Well, I moved back to Zimbabwe from Germany at the end of 2000. Mm -hmm. And that was a time when Zimbabwe was poised to go one way or another. Mm -hmm. And so in the time since then, we're in 2018 now, I've seen Zimbabwe go in a way which many of us feel is not the right direction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this has had an impact on people and the quality of their lives. And when I look at the school children in school uniform coming out of school, I always think, what are they going to do? What kind of Zimbabwe are they going to live in? What kind of life are they going to have? And I realized that I had to become interested in these things. Mm -hmm. I studied psychology at university and I studied filmmaking. So development, political science, economics is really not anything I'm acquainted with professionally at all. But I was looking for the kind of literature that would give me some insight into the issues that I was seeing on the ground in a way that I could understand because I'm an absolute lay person. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, the book uh, sort of goes through, you, you could relate to it at a, at a personal level, um, just based on the experience that you have of Zimbabwe. Um, and the book uh, sort of takes uh, a historical analysis of where most of the countries that we looked, um, uh, we were working on are at. It goes into the history of Zimbabwe and it goes into the current narrative of where Zimbabwe is, the, 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 the status that Zimbabwe is at. You went through the Zimbabwe chapter. What struck you? Well, reading the Zimbabwe chapter, I found that it was written in a style and from a perspective that was rather different from the rest of the chapters in the book. I found that the other chapters were looking forward. They were more analytic about where are we now? How did we get here? But most importantly, how do we go forward? And I found that the Zimbabwe chapter really seemed to concentrate more on we are here now because without really looking forward in a sufficiently analytic manner, in my opinion. Um, I think some of the other chapters were, were quite open in criticizing areas where they felt that things could have been different. And I think we should embrace that as Africans, a culture of constructive criticism, because if we don't do that, we're going to repeat the same mistakes. And I feel that the Zimbabwean chapter was written in a mode that was more celebratory mm -hmm. of uh, achievements that had been done. One doesn't want to minimize the achievements. Yes, great achievements have been made. Independence in Zimbabwe was an achievement. But we have to ask ourselves the question, is this where we want to be? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is no, which it is for many people, mm -hmm. then we have to find out what we are not doing right, which means evaluating ourselves and accepting where we are not doing things right so that we can do them better. Mm -hmm. From what you are saying, I get the sense that you've got a very clear idea 
of what you think a developmental state is. I mean, you talked about moving back to Zimbabwe uh, from Germany and uh, looking at where the country was and uh, you were making a comparison and feeling like it was moving in the wrong direction. So, and, and you, you've, you've taken time to, to read, um, I think, all the chapters. Very few people have done that. They've sort of picked a, a, a single chapter and, and gone through that. But you took the time to go through the entire chapter, the, the entire book. Um, what, what in your sense is a developmental state? What does it look like? So if we were to, to take Zimbabwe and, um, you know, in our own aspirations and say, this is w where it needs to go in order for it to be a developmental state. What are those changes that, that, that you would be pointing us to? Yes, um, I feel that I really didn't have a very clear idea of what a development state was mm -hmm. when I picked up the book. I did a workshop in 2006 in Zimbabwe and it was called Envisioning Zimbabwe. And the idea mm -hmm. was really to scope the situation in Zimbabwe with the view to constructing the Zimbabwe we wanted on paper at least. Mm -hmm. And what we found was that Zimbabweans were very able to point out what wasn't working, mm -hmm. but then to be able to say we need to do X, Y, Z in order to get it to work was not so easy mm -hmm. for them and it wasn't so easy for me. And I think the reason is because we don't understand how states work. Mm -hmm. We live in them. For us, the state is the water. Right. As though we were fish in a sea. So we need people like Osissa mm -hmm. and marvelous publications like this book towards democratic developmental states in South Africa to actually explain it to us. Mm -hmm. And it's not only explaining about how your state is functioning now, mm -hmm. but it's also explaining how other people have been able to come out of difficult situations, like the many references in the book to how Asia mm -hmm. was able to overcome. And for me, that, that was really interesting to read because Zimbabwe is constantly saying we are looking east. Mm -hmm. So the question for many Zimbabweans is, if you are looking east, why have you not done what people in the east have done mm -hmm. to stimulate development and a better living in their nations? Mm -hmm. So now, because of reading the book, mm -hmm. I do have a clearer idea. You know, we talk about dictatorship, but mm -hmm. then what do we actually want to see changed? Then we realize that, for example, um, the opposition now is looking to going into an election without having the electoral reforms. Mm -hmm. They're talking about having them, mm -hmm. but we don't know. Now I know that that is one of the key issues mm -hmm. because what we need to be doing is finding out where the stranglehold on power has its tightest grip. Right. And those are the areas that need to be addressed. And of course, elections are what actually distribute power. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the key areas. And there are many other areas, diversification of the economy, right. opportunities for different people, mm -hmm. um, reducing the inequality. Mm -hmm. The book talks about the enclave economies that we have in our countries mm -hmm. and how this is a structure that has persisted from the colonial era mm -hmm. into the era that we live in now. Yeah. Have our government seriously looked at um, decentralizing the economy in that mm -hmm. manner mm -hmm. or have they taken that over and only substituted a different elite yeah. so the, the book was very clear about where we need to be focusing our efforts for me as a media person um, I wish there had been more <laughs> <laughs> about the media in the yeah. book yeah. because I, I don't really feel that we can talk to people mm -hmm in a way that they are going to understand and relate to, unless we can tell them stories that really speak to their inner person. And uh, so even this whole idea of, okay, do we need electoral reforms or do we not? Mm -hmm. There are Zimbabweans today who will tell you, no, we don't, because we need to support the structures that are in power now that are anti-colonial. Yeah. 
there are Zimbabweans who believe that, and we can't blame them for believing that. Yeah. You know, there are people in the country who are still mourning uh, people who fell in the liberation struggle. Mm -hmm. And it's all very well to say, but okay, other people have also lost their lives in the struggle for democracy. That doesn't minimize this other person's suffering. Mm -hmm. So we have got to find a way that speaks to them at that point of suffering. And uh, I feel that this is where we are not really getting the message across. Yeah. And I can tell you about the Chinese, for example. Mm -hmm. They had a very clear media and art strategy. Mm -hmm about how they're going to do that. How they're going to do it in a way that they look outside China so that they present a particular um, image of themselves to the outside world from the 1970s mm -hmm. and how they're going to do that in the country. I think you, you touch on a number of like really important points. I think where you started off about, uh, you know, talking about the, the kind of state that delivers on, 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 on development. And you move on to talk about the, the democratic project that, that accompanies that. Um, you know, the example that you give of uh, the Zimbabwe's ideology of, of looking east. And I think what you're pointing to is something that's really interesting in the sense of what, uh, what came out of the Zimbabwe chapter, but also what came out of the South Africa chapter, right? So when we were looking at the different tenets of development, one of the important things that was set there is the, 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 the place of ideology and the role of visionary leadership. But I think what we're seeing as a shortfall in the direction that our countries are taking is where they don't go beyond pronouncing that ideology. So in the case of Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe says we're looking east, but it does not accompany the, the statement with pragmatic and progressive steps that you know, point towards the redistribution and deliberately dealing with the poverty and inequality that you're talking about. South Africa finds itself in the same trap where South Africa for many years, and I think Tabi Lang in his chapter, talks about the different points in the South African political trajectory where the current state has said we are a developmental state. But when you look at what the current state is doing, the, 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 the ideology behind its economic instrument is in direct opposite of what they might be trying to might be trying to deliver. But ideology in the space of economy and development is a very controversial is a very controversial question, right? There's the um, issue around uh, the neoliberalism uh, and the neoliberal agenda and how that has taken away the development opportunities and the, the redistribution and has, you know, stands in the way of reducing poverty and, um, and, and inequality. Um, what is your sense of that? And, I, and, 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 you know, it's an important issue to touch on because of the, 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 you know, the current discourse around what makes up populism, what is a populist state, and you know, the, the, the negative connotations that comes with populism. Where do you see the role of ideology in driving vision behind development, and how can we get it right? I do think that ideology is what drives vision. Mm -hmm. I think it's important for us to separate ideology for rhetoric. We are not there when ideologies are constructed in the politburos. When, when you say we, who is we? The ordinary yeah. person, the ordinary citizen mm -hmm. is not there. Mm -hmm. So these ideologies are constructed and then something is presented to us. Mm -hmm. And we are told that this is our ideology. But as you say, when we look at what is happening on the ground, we see that it cannot be that ideology and mm -hmm. so we have to understand that there is rhetoric that right. makes that is specifically designed to make us believe certain things whereas the ideology is happening somewhere else mm -hmm. now how does ideology come into being at the end of the day ideology comes into being through your felt experience because you, you cannot construct something that you have no reference with so people are making ideologies about what they have been through. This is why the ideology of the liberation struggle was so resonant mm -hmm. with the rest of the population, because we had all been through different forms of apartheid, 
and or the lack of opportunity that mm -hmm. came with that. Mm -hmm. So that was something that we could all tap into. So now, what are the lived experiences of these groups that are making these post-independent ideologies? Their experience is no longer the experience of being one of the 60 to 70 percent who are our rural populations. Mm -hmm. Their experience is no longer being one of those who has migrated from the rural area into the urban setting. Mm -hmm. And which urban setting are people migrating into? They're migrating into impoverished shanty towns because yeah. the cities were just not designed to cater yeah. for such large populations. Yeah. And these people are no longer part of that population. Yeah. Uh, their populations are the other governments where they go and that they have their meetings mm -hmm. and uh, the industrialists and uh, business people mm -hmm. who want to lobby them. Yeah. So those are the people who are constructing the ideologies. Yeah. And so I think that as individuals, as citizens, we really need to understand that we have to find ways of impacting mm -hmm. on our government so that we are part of their felt experience. Yeah. How, how do we do that? I, I, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quite, quite a profound point that you're making. Um, because again, when we look at the, the countries that have been very uh, successful in going the, the, the trajectory of a de developmental state, even countries that may not be there but are aspirational, uh, one of the important things that we're seeing there is really around a construction of a social contract, and which is a negotiated process that brings together the different uh, interests, right? Um, you talk about the silent majority, I'd like to, 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 to label them as such, uh, that are in rural areas, that are in impoverished areas, whose lived realities are not making it into the mainstream of how ideology is being articulated, the ideology that drives development. But how do we go about making those parts of society part of the front and center of defining what our development pathways ought to be? I believe that we go about that in a number of ways. Activism is one of them. So a robust civil society that is not compromised in any way. Uh, we do find that in Zimbabwe, it is increasingly easy for civil society to be compromised in many ways because opportunities are so lacking. People will want to remain in any area where they have an opportunity and they will want to act in such a way that they do not ruffle any feathers, whether be it from the government or be it from funders who are sponsoring them. And so they lose that activist edge. Mm -hmm. They come, in fact, very bureaucratic. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, one thing that happens, and we have to see how we can revive a more autonomous, mm -hmm. authentic civil society that's really drawing its inspiration from this silent majority. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've heard people talking about how when people occupy these spaces, mm -hmm they become another enclave in themselves mm -hmm. that is very much divorced from that silent majority that mm -hmm. they are to serve. So we have to see how we can stop that happening. I've seen the change in Zimbabwe from mm -hmm. the time when civil society was very vibrant and very tapped into uh, the grassroots and the silent majority. But I have seen that as things have become more difficult, mm -hmm. people's, uh, the range of activities that people even allow themselves mm -hmm. have shrunk. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is, how do we convey experience from one person to another? We do that by talking, by communication. Mm -hmm. So we need robust communication systems, robust forms of narrative that reach the silent majority as well and where they can respond to. Mm -hmm. And I think that we are so well placed to do that now with the digital economy.